Great, thank you so much, and thanks for having me. And so it is very exciting to follow up that talk because, you know, looking at, at people and, and really the statement that people know what they're eating, at least that's the people that are closer to me. To, um, there's a lot of people here that don't. But, you know, I, I take a step further. You look at nature and you look at even at insects and they clearly know what they're doing. And so that is a really exciting thing to look at, I think, to find out what we can learn from other organisms. So, I study monarch butterflies in my lab, and so monarch butterflies are extremely famous for their spectacular migration they undertake every year. So this is going on right now. If we speak, monarchs are coming down. They'll be here in Georgia in a few weeks, and then they'll fly down to Mexico, where up to hundreds of millions of monarchs come together and hang out there for the winter. And then in March or so, they fly up north and they start colonizing their breeding grounds. So that's why people like monarch butterflies. The reason I like them is not so much for that reason. This is just to, to show you some of the close-ups. When you go to Mexico, you really see all these butterflies getting together. And as I said, it's very popular. So this is, these are not my lab members, although I have had people in my lab also dressing up like monarchs. Now, this is just to show you how, how excited people are about monarchs, that they dress up um, like them and have these festivals. This is actually in St. Mark's, Florida, where we go every year and talk about all these things. But as I said, that's not really the reason I like monarchs. I like monarchs because they become sick. And monarchs become sick with a beautiful parasite. So I love parasites, as long as they don't infect myself. But this is Ophiocystis electroscara. It's a protozoan parasite. It's in the same group of parasites that also includes malaria parasites and toxoplasma, cryptosporidium, a lot of things that afflict humans. And this is a very virulent parasite that affects monarch butterflies. And this is really what drew me to study in monarchs. Now, of course, this is essential to the talk. This, you may be wondering, why am I here? This is, of course, the plant. Milkweeds are what monarchs are specialized feeders on. So the larvae can only feed on milkweeds. But the interesting thing is there's a lot of different species of milkweed, and they vary in their chemicals. And as it turns out, those chemicals have big effects on the monarchs and their parasites. What is really cool about the system is that it's a very nice system to work with. You can find out if a monarch butterfly is infected or not by simply sticking a, a sticker on the abdomen of the butterfly and then looking under the microscope, look at 80 times magnification, and you can see if there's parasites there. So you see all these, these dark little spots, or the big things are the scales of the butterflies, the little spots are the parasites. And so you can really see if that butterfly was sick or not. So very easy system to work with. And you don't have to kill the monarch to find out if it, if it was sick. And that's very nice for the people at these festivals. <laughs> so you can go there and find out if they are sick without killing them, which is great. So I want to address three different questions. The first is to just ask how virulent this is parasite. I want to give you a little bit of a background on what this particular disease is, what this parasite does to start with. And then ask the question, how do these milkweeds that monarchs use affect parasite growth and butterfly disease. And with that, as we're going to see, there's big effects. And then we can ask the question, can these monarchs actually use medicine? Do they use herbal medicine just like those, those ethnic communities that we just saw in the previous talk? Can we go to monarchs and find out that they behave the same with all their knowledge that they have accrued over the last 3.5 billion years? And then with that, I also want to ask the question, what are the costs and benefits of such medication? And this is an important question that we address in our research. We're looking at the chemicals, but also, you know, why don't all monarchs just use medicine if it's around? So starting to look at the costs and benefits of that. Now, I like this picture because it really sums up the consequences of parasite infection. This is not the kind of picture that you see in advertisement campaigns. You know, what always gets me about monarchs is that they're used for all sorts of completely random advertisement campaigns. To the extent I was in the Netherlands this summer at a bike rental place and they had a monarch butterfly. I said, there are not even monarchs in the Netherlands. It just makes no sense. People Google butterfly, monarchs come up. They're very famous. But this is a monarch that is very heavily infected. So infected, I told you that it forms the spores on the abdomen that you can pull off with a sticker. But if there is enough of them, they really disrupt the entanglements of the butterflies and they get stuck to their uh, pupil cases. And in this case, nature is, of course, nature, so you have this beautiful paper loss taking advantage of that situation and finding a very easy meal. So it's clearly a very detrimental parasite. And we can understand the negative effects of infection when we go through the life cycle of monarchs. So monarch butterflies lay eggs, and then from those eggs we get caterpillars. The caterpillars first start eating up their eggshell, and then they start eating the foliage of the milkweed on which they're laid. And then we go into the pupal stage. This is where the real metamorphosis occurs. 
new butterflies emerge. Now, if the monarch is infected with a parasite, so if we start, say, at the top there with a female butterfly that is infected, she will carry hundreds of thousands to millions of these parasites for us on her abdomen. And then what happens is when she lays eggs, some of these parasites just rub off onto the eggs and they rub off onto the milkweed on which the egg is laid. And then these caterpillars eat up the parasites, so they ingest them. Then they bro break open in the midgut, they release sporozoites. These sporozoites go through the midgut wall. They replicate at very, very high rates. And then they undergo sexual <coughs> reproduction toward the end of the pupal stage. And then the mark that emerges is again covered in tons of these parasites. Right, so it's a very passive process in the sense that these females lay eggs and these parasites get stuck to the eggs and to the milkweed. So that is how that works. So what are the effects of this infection? I already showed you pictures like that. So we see these kind of effects happening and more, happening more often when the monarchs are more heavily infected. So when parasite load goes up, they're on the x-axis from a few hundred thousand to several millions, we can see that the emergence probability of the monarch drops off. So higher infection means less chance of actually making it to the adult stage. These are two mating monarch butterflies, and we also find that the mating probability declines with increasing parasite growth as well. So very heavily infected monarchs don't mate as well, they're less likely to mate. And we don't know yet actually if that's because they're less attractive, or because they don't have the energy or the activity they need for the mating. So that's an open question. And beyond that, we also find that Monarchs don't live as long, so they live shorter when they're infected when they actually get through this whole process. And then when they end up laying eggs, they lay a lot fewer eggs when they are infected. So this is indeed a very detrimental parasite to monarchs. Now, to bring it back to migration, we have also found in several studies that the infection reduces the flight ability of monarch butterflies. And that is, of course, very detrimental for a, for a butterfly that has to fly more than 4,000 kilometers to reach the overwintering sites. So there's big costs involved there. So with that, the question is then, what are these monarchs doing about this? And that, that was really a question that I started addressing shortly before I came to Emory, asking the question, can monarchs use different plants? And so I started rearing different species of milkweed in the greenhouse. And we started very simple, just with two different species, Esclipus incarnata, the swamp milkweed on the left, and Esclipus curasakaga, tropical milkweed here on the right. There's a lot of reasons to use these two species. Most importantly is that they vary a lot in their secondary toxic chemicals, but very little in the nutritional properties, including nitrogen content and phosphorus and carbon. So they're very similar plants, but they differ very dramatically in the toxins that they produce. And then what we did is we reared monarchs on these different species, and then on, on the left I'm going to show you the results for uninfected monarchs, and here I'm showing you the lifespan of the adult butterflies once they had gone through the whole life cycle, made it to the adult stage, and we can see that these monarchs lived about the same amount of time. But then we infected monarchs with one of these four parasite, different, uh, parasite clones, different clones obtained from different areas in North America. And what we can see first of all is that the infected monarchs don't live as long as the uninfected monarchs. We already knew that from the previous work. What's really striking here is that when you rear the monarchs on the Kurosavika plants indicated in yellow, is that the infected monarchs live much longer than when you rear them on the incarnata plants indicated in orange. So somehow these parasitica plants are good for the, un for the infected monarch butterflies. They do better when they're reared on that plant. And the reason for that is that on that plant the parasites don't reproduce as much. So here are the clone means, so the average for all the butterflies in these treatment groups for parasitica and incarnata plants. And we can see that when the monarchs are incarnata the parasites do better, the monarchs do worse. When the monarchs are reared on parasitica plants in yellow, the parasites are impeded they cannot grow as well, and therefore the monarchs do much better. Now I mentioned to you that the big difference between these plants is related to their chemistry. And of course, another reason monarchs are very famous is because of their beautiful coloration. And this is really warning coloration that they're displaying. So they have this black and white, and then the orange, and the caterpillars they have black and white and yellow, and it really tells predators that these monarchs are toxic. And what James was talking about, you know, why do all these plants have these chemicals? Well, they have them to fend off all these threats in their lives, all these herbivores that try to eat them, all these pathogens that try to infect them. And so that's what milkweeds have done over evolutionary time. They have evolved all these cardanolides. So this is a class of chemicals. So actually, I think, I believe this one was on, on James' slide, actually. That's digo digoxin, I don't know, digitoxin. This is the one that I can pronounce. So that's good. And so, 
But what monarchs have done over time is really interesting. They have essentially hijack this whole system. So not only are they tolerant to these chemicals, they put them in their own tissues and that makes them toxic to their predators. And a lot of work is what's done by Lincoln Brower, who, who sadly just died last month. But this is you know, one of these scientists that has done so much to make us understand the natural history of a particular system and warning coloration and toxicity and migration. And so what he did in the 1960s was experiments where he fed marks on different species of milkweeds that varied in these trigenolites, then fed them to the blue jays in his lab, and then simply looked at how long it took for these blue jays to throw up. And it turns out that when you have higher concentrations of these chemicals in the plants, that the marks are more toxic, the blue jays throw up more quickly, they don't touch these marks again, right? So this is a warning coloration that where these birds learn not to use these monarchs again. So, Together with Mark Hunter at the University of Michigan, we have done a lot of chemical analyses on these plants. And here, what this is showing is the total cardinalite concentration for Curacelvica and Incarnata. You can see Curacelvica plants having much higher concentrations than Incarnata plants. And then when we look at the diversity of these cardinalites, there's not just one or two types, there's a lot of different types. So when we look at the Incarnata plants, there's only two types. This is a histogram, so we see that 100% of the plants had one type, 20% had another type. But when we look at the Curacelvica plants, we see this huge diversity of all sorts of different cardinalites. So these plants had more of these cardinalites, greater variety of them, and were more medicinal. We followed up that work, as I will show you later, that this is a general finding, not just for those two species. But with this in mind, we wanted to ask if monarchs can actually use this, and when they are infected, actually have the ability to use the more medicinal plants as a form of medicine. So we have two hypotheses. The first one is that larvae can preferentially consume the medicinal milk and then you give them a choice between the medicinal and the non-medicinal plant. And the second hypothesis is that the, it's not the larvae, it's the adults. You know? It's the mothers that know better. And so they, when they're infected, they lay their eggs on the plants that are more medicinal and thereby protect their offspring against the infection. And remember that it's the mothers that pass on these parasites. So that could be a very valid approach in the monarch life. So a lot of work here was done by a postdoc in the lab, Jenny, and an undergraduate student who was part of the SHURE program, so when we started this work. And so the, the first experiment was, was essentially to measure how much of the two different milkweeds the larvae ate throughout their life. And so this was a lot of measuring leaf discs and weighing them, and then the result was utterly boring, which usually happens in the lab. And so here, these are individual marks. Every data point is an individual mark. It shows the proportion of their total diet that consisted of the medicinal plant. And you can see that's 50-50 for infected monarchs and uninfected monarchs. So there was no difference there at all. So then we moved to choice tests for adult butterflies. So we had these monarch females that were mated, and then we put them in these big cages in our greenhouse here on campus. And we simply put two plants in, the, in these cages, a medicinal one, a non-medicinal one, and then we can simply count the number of eggs that these monarchs lay over a span of two hours to see if they have a preference for one or the other of the two plant species. And so this time the result was much more interesting, right? Because now we can see that the infected monarchs here have a strong preference to lay their eggs on the medicinal plant, whereas the uninfected monarchs do not. So this is the proportion of the eggs that they laid on the Curacelvica plant that had those medicinal effects. And we can see that the infected monarchs that basically are twice as likely for every egg they lay to lay it on the medicinal plant. And I think what's really interesting about this is that I told you that it's mothers that pass on these parasites to their offspring. They cannot prevent that. Adult butterflies already have these parasites. The parasites just sit on their abdomen. They're being dormant. They don't do anything interesting at that point. But what it does suggest is that these monarchs can actually increase the survival of their offspring by laying the eggs on the medicinal plants, which reduces infection, reduces parasite growth, and reduces the disease symptoms in their offspring. Now, what I think is really interesting is that when you look at the literature and what you see the last 15 years, when people started looking at self-medication in animals, they looked at things that were like us, like chimpanzees and gorillas and elephants, which are not quite like us, but also have big brains, right? And, and they live a long time, so they have this potential for associative learning that insects don't have. But now the last 15 years, we see that most of the examples where we have clear evidence for medication in animals come from insects. Where there's really bare caterpillars or ants, where there's butterflies, there's a lot of studies on honeybees right now that are showing this. So what 
That means is that animal medication is really very common and a major driver of all sorts of interesting things. And really what I, what I like to, to think is that they could also serve as a source of drug discovery. So going beyond um, you know, looking at ethnic communities, looking at animals, and maybe not the, you know, the most likely candidates that we would have thought 20 years ago, but actually looking at things that don't have big brains. Very briefly, I'm going to mention the costs of medication that, that we're finding, because just like medicine in humans, there could also be a lot of side effects of what monoclonalites are doing. First of all, I want you to show you that you know, the relationship we found between cardenolites and these medicinal effects, just looking at two plant species, we find that across a much wider range of species. This is a study we did across 12 species. And you can see when the cardenolite concentrations go up, the infected monarchs start living longer, but then it's drawn down by this beautiful plant that has a lot of cardenolites, very high concentrations. Then a postdoc in the lab, Laining Tao, she followed up this work and specifically chose plants that very, very widely in these cardenolites. And what we can see is when these cardenolite concentrations become really high, this is actually on a log scale, you can see the survival probability of monarchs declining. And then when you look at the effects on the lifespan on the monarchs, so here I'm actually plotting the non-polarity index, and so we believe that non-polar cardenolites are more toxic than polar cardenolites. We can see that when they're more toxic, the lifespan of uninfected monarchs declines as well. So there's a cost related to these parasites. The benefit, as we already predicted, right, is that the parasite load goes down. So that same toxicity brings down parasite load. So you have costs and benefits together, suggesting that for monarch butterflies, the best medicine, the best plants are those with intermediate toxicity, where they get the benefits in terms of reducing parasite growth, but don't have as many costs to pay in their own negative effects of eating these plants. So to sum up, I showed you some beautiful parasitology of this horrible parasite that does a lot of damage to monarch butterflies. And then I showed you that milkweeds can strongly affect the negative effects of these parasites, and can really reduce parasite infection and parasite growth. And that our results really suggest that monarchs can preferentially use these medicinal milkweeds as a defense against their parasites. And then finally I showed you that there's costs associated with this, that when these plants are very toxic to the parasite, they're also toxic to monarchs. And that's really suggesting that there's particular species that would be best for monarch butterflies. With that, I want to thank all the people that were involved over the years in all these different experiments, including all the experiments I didn't show and the ones that didn't work. <laughs> but these ones did. And I want to thank my funding sources and, of course, you for your attention.